Let's open up real quick to Psalm 34. And Pastor Stephen, if I didn't get a chance to meet you, or if you're watching for the first time online, we're starting in Psalm 34. A single verse in Psalm 34, verse 10. If you find it in your Bible, go ahead and stand up. Psalm 34, verse 10. Single verse from the Lord this morning says, Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. But those who seek the Lord will lack no good thing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the promise of your word that says even a young lion, even a person with all the riches and strength of this world will still experience at points of their life lack, insufficiency, a need. But for us, not because of our merit or our talent, our stature, our eloquence and our words, but because we seek you, we'll never lack anything. We cling to that word this morning, and we beg you that you would make us seekers. That all of our ambition wouldn't be the strength of a lion, but it would be seeking of your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We're we're in the second week of a series uh, called Seeker, and um, it's okay if you weren't around last week. You can catch up on the podcast or Facebook Live. And uh, what this series is, is all about is we're shifting our God-given passion from all the things that we don't have. There is so much raw passion in this room. I call it raw because it's like an uncut diamond. It, it, it's, you don't know what to do with it, but even, even as a small child, you know, you just have a passion that's inside of you. And it's one of the things that makes us so uniquely special. You know, my, my toddlers have passion and sometimes it's going 100 miles an hour in a way that I don't know what to do with it you know like they sometimes that all that passion is like I just need this blanket you know it's like if that blanket's in the wash it's just a mess you know it's like this passion is I got to watch Encanto again like like and, and, and life will be Miserable if I don't get in Kanto quick, you know, and um, you know, there's but you see that even in a child, and then as you watch a person's life, they they never really lose passion. It feels like you lose passion, it might shift a little here and there, but I found that nobody really loses it as much as they just reassign it, yeah. okay. And, and I, I told Lauren yesterday, I said, I want to talk today about, about misallocated passion. That's what we're talking about, and that's, that's, what this, that's what this series is all about, is taking the God-given passion that we have a tendency to put towards things that we don't have. That's where passion naturally is, is drawn to, is what I don't have, right? That's what it latches to, kind of like mold grows in darkness. Passion seeks what I don't have. And so, but what we have to do as seekers of God is take that passion and shift it from what I don't have to seeking the one who's given me everything I already have, all right? Because he's already given me so much. And all he asks, kind of like what Adam was saying, is all he asks is that I would take my passion and I would seek him, okay? And so this is really a series about finding true contentment. And believe it or not, everyone's after true contentment, whether you're a celebrity or you're rich or you're famous or you're poor, everybody's after contentment. The, The problem is that, what we do in our natural self is we create a mythical place. It's not a real location, but we create a mythical place. And we believe that if we could just arrive at that place, finally we'll be content. Now, your place and my place may not be the same place, but we all have a place that we've made. And maybe it's a marriage. If I could just, if I could just get married, or maybe it's a mythical job, or it's a mythical salary, or it's a mythical friend group, or a, a body figure, or whatever. You have this in your mind, and your passion attaches it to it, and then everything in your existence charges you towards that way. And I've done that. And what's scary is I've, I've been to, I'm in a mythical place when I was like 18, 19 years old. And then I got the luxury of going to it. 
Okay, that's a wonderful thing when you can create an imaginary world and think if you could just get there, how happy you would be. It's a wonderful thing when God lets you go there. Yeah. I was so grateful when I was 21 that I got to walk on the golden streets that I had made in my mind because it was it was full as cold. I didn't want any. I didn't want any of it. And because it was a mythical place, there isn't a place or a destination or a job or a salary or a spouse or a child that can actually produce contentment. Okay, no, no such place exists. Uh, one of the things that I want this series to be about and what I want us to do specifically today is I want us to erase our just, just, okay? We're erasing our just. You get that J-U-S-T-S. You have a lot of just. And uh, I have a lot of just sometimes too, you know? The, your just are when you say things like, it's just my house. Everything we find, it's just my house. If I... We have one too many bedroom, 300 square feet too little. Our kitchen needs to, my kitchen just needs to be remodeled, right? If I just had a gym membership, if I just had a new car, if, if I just had a new job, if I just had a, a better a spouse, if I just had a better spouse, you know, if I just had a better looking spouse, if I, if, if I just had children, if I just had obedient children, if I just, if I just um, was homeschooling, if I just send them back to public school, <laughs> right? It's, it's just my friends. You, you see these just, you live by them. You, we, you live one just to another, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. And then as soon as you get your just, you don't celebrate for one second. You find a new one, right? Because you know why? Because it didn't work. It wasn't just that. As much as, you, as much as your passion latched to it and you believed that it was just that, it wasn't. The Israelites were the same way. They said, if we could just get out of Egypt, okay, they got out of Egypt. Well, if we can just get to Canaan, right? And then eventually it became, if we can just go back to Egypt. Isn't that funny in that story? I was just reading that this morning. They were saying, you took us out of a place of milk and honey, right? But that wasn't it. The promise was, I'm going to take you to a place of milk and honey. But they got so tired of where they were at. They said, could you just, could you just take us back? Sometimes we think, if I could just lose weight, if I could just get out of debt, if I could just get healthy, if I could just get a better job, if everyone around me could just get their act together. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> that's the best. You have those days, and you just start thinking, man, I just can't stand Sally. Well, you know what? It ain't just Sally. It's Bill, too. And it's Ted. And, I, and, and, you know, it's just my boss, and it's just my coworkers, and it's just my mama. And it's just, when the just, listen, when the just grow, it's just you. <laughs> it's just you. And that sucks, man, because it's so much easier to think, oh, it's just my wife. My marriage sucks because it's just her. You will sleep at night good tonight thinking it's just her. And if she would just get it together, that's a lot harder than it's just me. And if I would just get it together, that's a lot harder. And the passion wants to yoke itself to all the just. And it creates a horrible, horrible feeling. There's, there's no worse feeling. There's, there's no worse thing that could happen than for you to have disproportioned passion. Okay. To put your passion in the wrong place. And a lot of those things I mentioned, they're not bad goals, I know how enticing they are to buy into it. Many of them aren't bad, but they're not what God put you here to seek after. He is. He's what he, he put you here to seek after. Health isn't a bad thing to pursue. Getting in out of debt in this year, it's not a bad thing to pursue. But I can't pursue health this year with the portion of passion that I'm supposed to seek God with. It'll never work. Okay, And if we're not careful, we'll just move our whole existence from one just to another. Because contentment isn't really about what we have. It's about what we seek. Right? I was trying to figure out this series in my mind. I, th I, thought, I, th I thought, Lord, just as excited as I am to preach about seeking you, I'm just as excited to, to preach about contentment. And when I was getting ready for this series, I couldn't figure out which, which way this series was going. Is it a series about seeking you or is it a series about contentment? And he said, it's a series about both. Yeah. yeah. Because there's no contentment outside of seeking him. That's where contentment lives. Is because I'm seeking him, I know that I will always have everything that I need. Yeah. Right? That's what literally makes me content. Is I'm not taking my passion and seeking it after what I don't have. I'm taking my passion and I'm seeking after the one who's given me everything I already do have. You know, every morning when you wake up, 
Sometimes I have to bring my a toy. You know, I just get bored up here sometimes. Just kind of keep myself entertained. But you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about it. I was like, every morning when you wake up, there is literally just this passion that's downloaded into you. And like I said, I don't know how you're going to use it. You know, you, you may use it on Xbox one day or Nintendo, or you may use it on Facebook. That's like an energy passion vacuum. Yeah. You know, you, you may be using it trying to craft the perfect post to describe the day you wish you were having. You know, you, 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 you may... Yeah, come on. Now yeah. other people are looking at it going, oh, which my day was that great? That day uh, sucks. Yeah. <laughs> they had one shining moment. They took a picture of it. They, you know what I'm saying? But, but, like, but listen, there's, there's so many places that you could go with your passion, and every day you get to choose. Where do you want it? It's like this little pullback toy. See this little toy here? When you pull it back, it's just it's ready to go, right? It, I know not everybody can see this, but you can imagine. It's ready to go. <laughs> but you get to pick where where is it going. Whoa. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> right? There's this, you see, you hear that? There's this passion that's in you. And, you know, a lot of times you feel like you have to create passion in people. Like, oh, if I could just make everybody in here passionate about Jesus, man, your life would be so different. But the reality of it is, is I know a lot of you guys, and you're all passionate about a lot of things. I don't have to create passion in you. Could I just shift your passion to where it's off of all the things that you're seeking, that you, whether you get it or you don't get it, it won't matter, right? Your fourth dog won't make you any happier than your third dog. (laughs) God's crazy for that. You're crazy for that. Okay? Make it $14 an hour. If it shifts to $16, it ain't going to be that big of a difference. Just take my word for it, okay? But if you could take that passion that you have and you could put it on Jesus, everything would change. Yeah. Everything says, you've got it in you. You just have to pick. Do I want to go towards the stuff that I want? Or do I want to go towards the God who made me? Do I want to put my passion towards him? You know, one of the, I remember, it, it's wild. This is, it's not my notes. Forget the notes. Um, I remember years ago, I, I always had a passion for teaching about seeking God. Because everything that I've ever had, I can't make any sense of, except for the fact that I sought after God. Yeah. And, and and when when he makes a covenant with us that if you seek me, remember that verse we read, you lack no good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so many sins are bought into by not believing that. Because if I stop believing that if I could seek after him, then we take our focus and our passion and we start shifting it towards all these other things. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember years ago, I, I taught a sermon. It's one of the few sermons I've actually preached a few times. But I was... Uh, I started this, I preached this all the way back in, in when I was a youth pastor years ago. And I, and I wrote on a board, I said, everybody pick out four things they want. Right? And I wrote on a dry erase board four things that, that I wanted. And we all wrote down four things that we wanted. And these are four things, and you can do this in your mind today, four things that you want. I want to go back to school. I want to get a college degree. I want to make more money. I want to have a big family. I want peace in my family. I want a better marriage. I want all these things. And I said, now what I want you to do is I want you, instead of taking any of your passion and actually seeking after those things, I want you to just, for for, for those things that don't even matter, and just seek after God. Because he will make all those things happen if you just seek after him. But if if you seek after those things, even if you get them, they'll be mannequins. They'll be fake. They they won't even be real. They won't even be what God has for you. You may seek after a job and find one, but is it the one that, that he wants for you? You may seek a relationship. But is it, the God, is it the God relationship, the one that he made for you to have? And so, listen, God has supplied in us the passion that we need to find whatever we seek after. But we have to choose the direction that we go. And I want to turn to Philippians chapter 4 real quick. We're talking about seeking and contentment. And... Um, Philippians chapter 4, there's a, Paul's writing here, and like I said, we like to think that contentment is a place that I could get to, and that's why we, that's why when we tell ourselves the just, then we'll, you'll, just as quickly as you, you create a just, you'll find that your passion will attach itself to that. Like I can, it's a, it's amazing how much I can get done sometimes in like an hour, because if I'm passionate about it, I'll move towards it. You know, like if if I got a passion that I was going to remodel the kitchen, 
I could probably do it by the Super Bowl tonight. I mean, like, I, it's just when passion is there, I, I was saying it look good, but it'd be mixed up a bit. <laughs> demo, demo day. You know what I'm saying? But when you get, when you have that passion, especially when you attach it to the just, because then you think, yes, it's the kitchen. That's the only thing that's been holding me back this whole time. And you just, and you just attach yourself to it. And then it gets all your passion. And like I said, it's not necessarily bad that you give passion towards things that aren't Christ, but you have to give your passion first to him and then let him allocate where it should go. Okay, so in Philippians chapter 4, Paul wrote this in a jail cell. He said in verse 11, he said, Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing, or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. He said, I, he said, I, know, I know contentment. I, I know truly how to be content. And it wasn't because he was put up in a penthouse of a palace. Right? He didn't, he didn't have maids and servants waiting on his beck and call. When he's writing this letter, I don't even know what he's writing this on. Some kind of scrap, you know, something that he found in a jail cell. You know what I'm saying? What a, what a word to say. He's, he's writing to the church at Philippi and he says, I know the secret. Look at your neighbor and say, I know the secret. I know the secret. I, he said, I know the secret. I remember when I was a kid or when I was growing up, there was a book that came out called The Secret. You guys remember that? It kind of took the world by storm. It was just this, and honestly, it was only by, it played off of the human nature for curiosity, right? Because it, the, the book's not that great, right? It's a, like a book about the power of positive thinking or something like that. But, but, but it was so curious, it was, but it's also curious. There's a secret to this whole thing. Like there's a, and everyone's going to buy this book and Oprah's all jazzed about it, so, so, so is everybody else and, and so we're, you know, and there's a movie, and I remember, um, I think my parents might have got the movie, and I remember watching the movie, and it's all like, ooh, the secret. And you're like, and they kind of like, they kind of lead you on. It's like you're like 45 minutes in, like, what is the secret? What is it? I'm so ready for it, you know. And um, I kind of try to preach that way sometimes, like, you know, you're like, what is this thing? What is it? And, and, and Paul says that. He goes, I know the secret, right? Like, guys, I know how to be content. Which, which means I know how to be filled with joy in the midst of anything. I, I, I've been shipwrecked. I've, I've been beat. I've, I've been starved. I've been, they took me out of the city one time and stoned me. And I got up. And, and right now I'm just waiting to die. But I know how to be content in everything. And he said, I know the secret. And the very next verse, and then we all quote this, and we don't really have a lot of context to it. He says, for I can do everything. Through Christ, who gives me strength. He said, Christ is the secret. Me seeking him is why I'm content everywhere that I go, because everywhere that I go, he's there. And everything that I'm after is him. Like David said, he's the one thing that I seek. He's what I want the most, is just to dwell with him. And because he's all that I'm seeking, no matter where I go or no matter what I have or what I don't have, I always have him. So I'm always content. True contentment is knowing only God can fill me, so I'm not going to waste any time looking for anything else that ever will. Because it won't be that car, that job, that friend circle, that perfect church. It's fine if the Lord, I don't know that one. If you guys know it, tell me about it. Um, I'd like to visit sometime. It, it, it's fine if the Lord wants to give it all to me. But I know that with or without it, I'll be content with just him. That's where we have to get to. You know, we talked about the puzzle piece last week, the, the idea of, you know, there's all these pieces to your life that you want to put together, you know, and they're, and they're all significant. Don't get me wrong. It's, you know, you, you get your mind wrapped around that you need a new wardrobe and you go out and buy a new wardrobe. And that might, that's nice. It's nice to have a new wardrobe. Nothing wrong with that, right? But you'll find that in putting together the new wardrobe that you can't create a full picture. You, won't, you won't, can't be fully satisfied by a full wardrobe. There's a lot of rich, famous people with a lot of really weird clothes that are very miserable people, right? And they, have, they paid a stylist to pick out that outfit for them. They don't even have an excuse. Okay, they got dressed in the dark and woman's closet. 
And so it, it's just, but they're, they're so, it's weird. I don't have time to get to that area. Right now. It's just weird. But the point of it is, is that it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy you. It, it's a puzzle piece. It's nice, but, but no matter how many pieces that you put together, there will always be a missing piece right in the center and nothing will ever do the trick. There's not a drug that you could try. Nothing will get you high enough. You can't drink enough. You can't sleep with enough people. You can't do anything to actually make you feel complete except seek after Jesus because he is the missing puzzle piece. He is what makes us feel complete. In uh, Matthew chapter 6, I want to start in, in chapter 6, and I'll read about a good portion of it, but I'll start in verse 25. It says, this is why, Jesus, Jesus is talking here, says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? That's the funny thing about worry is worry is always... The problem in worry is never the thing that you're worrying about. It's, worry is always the absence of faith. Yeah. Worry is always whenever I've quit believing that God's got me. And I want to take this into my own hands. And that's why worry is created. So he says, so don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? Anyone ever tell you that? Don't worry about it. Quit worrying about it. It's like it's kind of like useless advice. I give it to people all the time, but it's kind of useless. It's like, thanks. I'll I won't. <laughs> this is me like stopping to worry. Like it's, it's so it's so hard once you get once you start to worry about something. It's hard to stop. The reason it's hard to stop is because you've got so much invested. You have so much worry, you have so much time, you have so much energy, you have so much money, and it's all, all your momentum is going towards that thing. And so if someone says, hey, stop, you shouldn't be worrying about it. It's like, it's like a train that's derailed. How do I stop it? And it's not really that we can stop worry, because the problem with worry is, is that the passion that God gave me to seek Him has attached itself to a problem and to a thing. And so it's misappropriated. The problem is that I can't stop it. The problem is I have to reassign it. Okay? So you've been researching how to get rid of the mold in your house, and now you're basically a professional. Come on, somebody with that term. Yeah, somebody. There's a name for that kind of person, whatever that is. Right? And you feel as though you could get under there and do it all, but you haven't slept in three days because you're pretty sure the house is going to fall down. Everyone's going to get sick with a rare form of cancer that you read about on WebMD. And it's all of this, and your skin is crawling, and someone says, would you quit worrying about this? You go, I would punch in the face. I'm not worried about this. I'm healthily concerned for the health of our home and our family, right? The problem isn't, isn't that you can stop. It's that all of that should have been assigned to seeking Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem was that you put a passion that God gave you that's bubbling up inside of you. You let it become attached to something else, right? And, and, and so there's too much invested in it. We invest too much in things. And like I said, it's not a sin to invest in places, but I must always invest my first and my best into Christ. And then I let him. I can't tell you the times he's given me solutions for problems. Like time and time and time again, you know, I'm like, you know what? I don't know how, I don't know the answer to this. I'm just going to seek the Lord. I'm going to put this off, you know, and I know that in time, the Lord will come up with an answer. If you start to feel, I want to give you a word of advice. The moment that you feel as though you're concerned transforms into worry. And you can feel that. You can feel it. There's just a little extra heartbeat where you go, oh, I'm worrying about this. Stop thinking about it entirely. You'll never come up with a solution for anything in the worry place. Okay? There are no solutions there. 
The moment that you get there, stop it. I don't care if you need a job so bad that your family is going to miss their food all next week and you're just researching it to death. When you get to that worrisome place, just stop and seek the Lord because you're, you're, you're misusing your passion. When God wants you to, somebody will come and knock on your door and say, I want you to come work for me. Or he won't and you'll have a check in the mailbox. He says, look at the birds. I always like to say, they ain't doing squat. You ever watch the birds? They really ain't doing a lot. Singing their little songs. Worshiping the Lord. Right? They're all their little noises and stuff. That's cute. Ain't doing a whole lot. They never miss any meals, though. Isn't that amazing? You know? You're so worried about what you're going to wear and all these things. He says, look at the flowers. I look better than any of you. And they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna wither in a few days, right? But, but it's not that the thing is wrong. It's that that's not, what the, that's not what God put passion in me for. You understand what I'm saying? And so worry really happens when I misappropriate passion, when I put passion into the wrong thing. And you could, put, you could misproportion your passion anywhere. You, you, you could just accidentally get, you, even a lot, I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of times it's good things. You will get so hooked on getting out of debt that you you just, it's like you and Dave Ramsey are like that. <laughs> like every day of your life. And it'll drive you crazy. No offense. Where's he going? <laughs> <laughs> right? But hopefully Dave would agree. Your whole life mission can't be getting out of debt. Right? right? You get out of debt and you still be miserable. You're, you have to take your passion and put it towards Jesus. And then he could pull you out of debt. It's a lot of times health, it's healthy things. It, it, it's losing weight, right? How many of y'all ever just rolled your eyes at somebody on a new health journey? Right. Come on. It's like, it's just like, they're just, why? Because why? they just get like lost in it, right? You know what I mean? They're just, they just, because it's, they, it's not bad to get healthy. It's not, it's not bad to eat right. It's not bad to exercise. But you can lose yourself in it. And it's not what God put the passion for. All right? You understand? And, and, and so passion has to flow through Christ. And then he assigns it to the places that we go. And, but he must always be what we seek first. Right? So we, as we continue reading, he says, So don't worry about these things saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. It's all they think about. When you don't know Christ, it's all you think about is your just. Just, just, just. It's one just to another just. It's a new house, new car. I got the big house. I got to put stuff in it. I got to put different stuff in it. I don't want people remodel, remodel their house like once a month. New furniture, new rug, new Amazon trucks just like tagging out on the driveway. You know what I'm saying? It's like stuff, 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 stuff. We all get lost in it. It's crazy. You know, but he says these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. What does that mean to do, that you're... It's all you think about. You know you're not seeking the Lord when all you think about is you're just. Yeah. It dominates your thought. But he says, your heavenly father already knows your needs. Praise the Lord for that. He already knows my needs and he knows my wants. He knows everything. So verse 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. That's why I can be content in all circumstances because I don't have to chase after all the just because Jesus knows them already. Yeah. He knows about the mold. He knows about your kitchen. He knows about your body and how you're unhappy with it. He knows about all of these things. He knows about your wardrobe. He cares about even the little things. I can't tell you I could write a book of all the little things God's blessed me with over the years, right? But he says, I want you to just seek me. And then in seeking me, I'm going to give you all the little things. You know, everybody knows that they shouldn't worry. But a lot of people don't understand that the cause of worry is when I, when I misappropriate my passion that's designated to Christ and I give it to something else. Right? It's kind of like gambling with the mortgage. Okay? It changes. You, you, you get that reference? There's one thing to gamble, right? But it's different when you're gambling with something that already has a place. Right? So that's what happens when we're, when, we're, when we're putting all of our passion into these other things is I'm gambling with something that belongs to Christ. And there's no winner there. If I get it, I lose. If I don't get it, I still lose. Right? And, and so 
आया आई थिंक अलॉट ऑफ टाइम्स दैट the the people that we experience in life the people that we're around i think we don't understand that that's a lot of times their problem is when things happen to them you ever been around someone that looks like they overreact about something or it's like a little thing but it was a big thing right i had a friend one time he got laid off from his job you know we all around him we all said just get another job and she's get another job and you hated that job anyway he was devastated he had a drug problem he got right back he had just got clean he got right back on drugs he was crushed and and i didn't understand why it was such a big deal to him but the reason why it was such a big deal to him was because he had so much invested in that job and so all i saw was 13 dollars an hour what he saw was blood sweat and tears and four years of waking up at 5 a.m. relationships built schmoozing that it happened you know he all he saw was all these things and he was devastated it's kind of like in a movie when you have a You know, I couldn't think of an actual movie, but I feel like I've seen this plot played out a lot where there's a common item like a briefcase or a basketball or something. You know, and somebody it gets stolen. And the main character is like devastated and the the supporting role is like, dude, it's just a basketball. No, no. And you're like, is it is in the briefcase? Yeah. He goes, it's just a basketball. He goes, no, there's a million dollars inside that basketball. It's like, oh, it's not just a basketball. What happens is we invest so much of ourselves into all these things. We put too much in the things of this world. and then when they inevitably go away or crushed in a way that the people around us don't even understand because we had so much more invested in that than we realize it's kind of like you ever been on a diet where you like majorly caused your body pain for like a week what does it feel like when you stand on that scale and it goes up a pound yeah it's like i had so much invested in this and there was no harvest for it yeah. it's this it's this devastating blow right and what happens is we invest it's this whole problem of but it all starts with investing miss uh, investing the passion because if i put all the passion in the things the things will never pay off enough right but what happens is it, 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 i use a poker reference here okay. but sometimes it's hard to fold on the river the river's the last card in the game of texas holdem it, it doesn't matter what your hand is it's so hard to fold when you've invested so much Right? This is why girls, boys do it too. Man, girls do it a lot. This is why girls will date deadbeats 5 years longer than they should. Amen, brother. Because I have invested so much in him. But girl, you ain't never going to get a payoff. Right? You should have cashed out. 3 <laughs> years ago and hit the road. Amen. But it's hard. You know, that's the real story of the parable of the rich young ruler. It's not that it was hard for him to walk away from money or fame. It was hard for him to walk away from what he had invested his life into. Jesus says give all this up and seek me first. But what about all my investments? What about the what I've always sown everything into? And, and so what we have to do is we have to uproot our passion, the first fruits of our passion from all these other places and we have to seek first the kingdom of God. Before we leave today, I want to give you a challenge. Um Solomon um he asked the lord for wisdom solomon was david's son and the lord said to solomon i'm going to grant you you know whatever you want just if you ask for it and he asked for wisdom and so the lord gave him wisdom and so solomon uh, writes the book of proverbs and he writes the book of ecclesiastes and that's my challenge for you this week is i'd like you to read the book of ecclesiastes it's only 12 chapters you could do it today you could do a little bit of it throughout the week i know you're already on a reading plan but it won't take you that much to read ecclesiastes as well one of my favorite books it's kind of a sad book but because Solomon in all of his wisdom he tried everything okay many like like we do often he tried having money for a while he tried having women for a while he tried having houses for a while he tried having power for a while and he keeps using the same phrase throughout the whole book of ecclesiastes he says but it's like i'm chasing the wind he just kept saying that it's like i'm chasing the wind he said i i i've tried having a palace that's bigger than all other palaces he said but it's like chasing the wind but he did have that palace so so it wasn't that he was really chasing wind the things that he was chasing he was actually finding but it felt as though what i'm really after i haven't found yet so he kept saying it's like chasing the wind and he goes through all this stuff you know oh if i just have this or i could just have that 
And, and everything that he was seeking, he did find. But he was never finding anything worth finding. You know, so he goes through the whole book, and we'll just turn, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 real quick. He goes through this whole book, and, and uh, at the end of it, he comes up with this. And we're in chapter 12. And it's kind of anticlimactic because he's just, you know, saying all this stuff and he's got all this wisdom in there because it's so, he's so wise. But at the end of all this wisdom, he says in verse 13, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands. For this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do including every secret thing, whether good or bad. You know, it goes through all of this stuff. And he said, when it's all said and done, you know what? He's writing this to his son. He said, son, when it's all said and done, I found really had a whole lot more to life than just seeking the Lord. I've had a lot of money. Sometimes I didn't. I was married. I had children. But you know, I found the only thing really worth chasing after with everything the Lord's given me is him. That's what he said at the end. Because he knew nothing else will ever satisfy me like Jesus can. You know, you are a seeker. That's the purpose of this series. I'm not trying to make you a seeker. You are a seeker. God made you that way. But he's given you the choice of what do you want to seek after. Okay, do you want to seek after the wind? By all means, you can. I know I have, and sometimes a big gust of wind catches me off guard, and I start seeking it again. Right? But you have the choice. Do I want to seek after the wind, or do I want to seek after him? Okay, because if you seek after the wind, you won't find it. It might feel like it's a job or if it's money or if it's a relationship or whatever, but you will never feel as though you're actually finding anything because you were made to seek him. That's what you were made to do. That's what the passion that he's given you, that's what it's actually for, is for pursuing him like Robin here. Okay? And, and you can try all this other stuff and it'll just be like one puzzle piece to another puzzle piece and the next drug and the next thing and the next house and the next car and the next... This and that, I just got to lose five more pounds, and I got to, you know, just get all, get all this stuff in here. I got you know, to the wrong boyfriend, get a new boyfriend, get a new, you know, all this different stuff in here. And it's like, you know, he makes a promise to us. He says, if you seek me first, then I'll take care of all your needs. Isn't that, that should bring us so much assurance, so much rest. I don't have to seek after the things. You know, there's people, you know, I mean, and like I said, I hope you know I'm preaching definitely to the choir. I'm de this is definitely for me. I've sought after everything you could seek after in my life. You know, I've gotten caught up in so many whirlwinds. You know, I've thought, oh, I've got to buy a house and I, you know, do this. Me, me and Lauren spent six months one time just trying to lift up our credits because we were like, we're going to lift up our credit. We've got to crazy just seek after getting a good credit. Guys, I got an 800 credit score. It was, a, it was awesome. But I couldn't buy a house. It wasn't the Lord's will. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, what a journey we went on. It was so exciting. Uh, I check credit card, and I'm like, woo, 800. Not doing anything with it. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> we sought after everything. You know, it's, oh, we're going to buy a house. Oh, we're not going to buy a house. Oh, we're going to, oh, we're pre approved. $70,000. No houses for $70,000. <laughs> okay, well, that was great. Back off Zillow. <laughs> Stupid Zillow. You know, it's like, you, know, you get lost in it, though. You just, you know, and then all the time I go, Bring it back in. The Lord will put me in the place that I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. That's what we have to trust. You know, you get, but you get lost in all these things, and it won't satisfy you. Even if you found it, it wouldn't satisfy you. I've been in people that have, I've been in people's homes that have beautiful homes. They have empty lives because they're, they have misappropriated passion. We must give the best and the first of ourselves to Jesus. This is a biblical principle. It works like tithing. That's why we pass the buckets around. It's not just to pay the rent on this place. It, 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 even if we went out back and burned it, it wouldn't make any difference to you because it's your calling. You have to give your first fruits and your best to the Lord. It's from cover to cover in the Bible. And it's so that it creates a culture in you that because I'm giving my first and my best to him, that he's guiding me and leading me with what to do with the rest of it. Right? So I'm giving him, you know, my 10%. I'm giving him my tithe. But I'm asking in that sacrifice for wisdom of what to do with the rest of it. It's the same with my passion. There's no one in this room, no matter what your occupation is, that should be more passionate about anything in your life than Jesus. I don't care if you're a brain surgeon. You say, what's your greatest passion? Jesus. Right? I don't care if you work at the post office. What's your greatest passion? Jesus. And then you let him, like a filter, it siphons through him, and then he decides where it should go. 
Because we're all wearing so many hats that it's impossible. We're going to drop the ball somewhere, right? Because we're husbands and we're fathers and we're mothers and we're wives and we're step parents and we're grandparents and we're cousins and aunts. And how could I possibly know how to do everything right? I can't. And I'm not asked to. But I can seek him first and then he can lead me where I'm supposed to go and what I'm supposed to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you haven't laid such a heavy burden on us that we have to seek after everything that we want. Sometimes we pick up that calling ourselves, but you haven't put upon us, Lord. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. You've said of us, don't be like unbelievers who worry about every little thing and if they're going to get their next meal or what they're going to wear next week. Instead, just seek me first because I know everything that you need. And my promise is that sometimes even young lions go hungry. But you, who seek me, you'll never lack anything that you need. But we cling to that promise. Let us become not seekers of things and stature and money and the next status. Lord, we surrender all of our just this morning, all the things that we've bought into, that this is just the problem or that's just the problem. We surrender that all to you today. We say, you know what? If Paul in a prison cell with nobody next to him could say, I have all I need and more, then surely I, in the abundance of the things that you've given me, can find contentment as well in seeking you. Lord, would you realign our passion again with you? You first. And then from there, would you channel it through the places that it should go and what we should be doing? We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just to sing one more song, and I'll have the prayer team come forward. And as we're singing this last song of worship, if you feel a thumping in your heart to come forward and to believe in Jesus, surrender your life to him for the first time, or maybe for the sixth time, Whatever it is, but if you're like a lot of us and you feel as though, man, I've given away Jesus' portion of passion, and I just want to return to the foot of the cross and say, you can have my first and my best again. Come forward this morning as we sing.